Blessings, 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 beloved. I am Mama Pam, a.k.a. Pamela Dobson, and I do read, beloved, seven minutes every day so you do not have to read. This first portion of what we are going to do is we are going to record um, 2 Samuel, the 15th chapter, the first verse. Today is Thursday, January the 26th, 2023. We will read chapter 15 in its entirety. Then we're going to come back and we're going to do the commentary. And I'm hoping my cameras can record all as much of stuff I'm trying to get to record. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's get busy. 2 Samuel 15 chapter, reading from the King James Version of the Word of God. And it reads, And so it came to pass after this, that Absalom prepared him chariots and horses, and fifty men to run before him. And Absalom rose up early and stood beside the way of the gate. And it was so that when any man that had a controversy came to the king for judgment, then Absalom called unto him and said, Of what city art thou? And he said, Thy servant is of one of the tribes of Israel. And Absalom said unto him, See, thy matters are good and right, but there is no man deputed of the king to hear thee. Absalom said, Moreover, Oh, that I were made judge in the land, that every man which hath any suit or cause might come unto me, and I would do him justice. And it was so that when any man came nigh to him to do obeisance, he put forth his hand and he took him and kissed him. And on this manner did Absalom to all of Israel that came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. And it came to pass after 40 years that Absalom said unto the king, I pray thee, let me go and pay my vow which I have vowed unto the Lord in Hebron. For thy servant vowed a vow while I abode at Gersher in Syria, saying, If the Lord shall bring me again indeed to Jerusalem, then I will serve the Lord. And the king said unto him, Go in peace. So he arose and he went to Hebron. But, but, and but. Absalom sent spies throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, As soon as ye hear the sound of the trumpet, then ye shall say, Absalom reigneth in Hebron. And with Absalom went 200 men out of Jerusalem that were called, and they went in their simplicity, and they knew not anything. And Absalom sent for Ahithophel, the Gilonite, David's counselor, from his city, even from Gilo, while he offered sacrifices. And the conspiracy was strong, for the people increased continually with Absalom. And there came a messenger to David, saying, The hearts of the men of Israel are after Absalom. And David said unto all his servants that were with him at Jerusalem, Arise, and let us flee, for we shall not escape from Absalom. Make speed to depart, lest he overtake us suddenly, and bring evil upon us, and smite the city with the edge of the sword. And the king's servant said unto the king, Behold, thy servants are ready to do whatsoever my lord the king shall appoint. And the king went forth, and all of his household after him. And the king left ten women, which were concubines, to keep the house. And the king went forth, and all the people after him, and tarried in a place that was far off. And all his servants passed on beside him. And all the Cherethites, and all the Pelethites, and all the Giddites, six hundred, six hundred men which came after him from Gath, passed on before the king. Then said the king to Ittai, the Gittite, Wherefore goest thou also with us? Return to thy place and abide with the king, for thou art a stranger and also an exile. Whereas thou camest but yesterday, should I this day make thee go up and down with us? Seeing I go whither I may, return thou and take back thy brethren. Mercy and truth be with thee. And Ittai answered the king and said, As the Lord liveth, and as my lord the king liveth, surely in what place my lord the king shall be, whether in death or in life, even there also 
will thy servant be? And David said to Ittai, go and pass over. And Ittai the Gittite passed over and all his men and all the little ones that were with him. And all the country wept with a loud voice and all the people passed over. The king also himself passed over the brook of Kidron and all the people passed over toward the way of the wilderness. And Zadok also and all the Levites were with him bearing the ark of the covenant of God. And they set down the ark of God and Abiathar went up until all the people had done passing out of the city. And the king said unto Zadok, Carry back the ark of the Lord into the city. If I shall find favor in the eyes of the Lord, he will bring me again and shoot me both it and his habitation. But if he thus say, I have no delight in thee, behold, here am I. Let him go, let him do to me as seemeth good unto him. So the king said also unto Zadok the priest, Art not thou a seer? Return into the city in peace, and your two sons with you, Ahaz the son, and Jonathan the son of Abiathar. See, I will tarry in the plain of the wilderness, until there come forth, until there come word from you to certify me. So Zadok therefore and Abiathar carried the ark of God again to Jerusalem, and they tarried there. And David went up by the accent of Mount Olivet, and wept as he went up, and had his head covered, and he went barefoot. And all the people that was with him covered every man his head, and they went up weeping as they went up. And one told David, saying, Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. And David said, O oh Lord, I pray thee, turn the counsels of Ahithophel, Ahithophel into foolishness. And so it came to pass that when David was come to the top of the mount where he worshipped God, behold, Hushai, the archite, came to meet him with his coat rent and earth on his head. Unto whom David said, If thou passest on with me, then thou shalt be a burden unto me. But if thou return to the city and say unto Absalom, I will be thy servant, O king, as I have seen thy father's servant hitherto, so will I now also be thy servant. Then mayest thou for me defeat the counsel of Ahithophel. And hast thou not there with thee Zadok and Abiathar the priest? Therefore it shall be that what things soever thou shalt hear out of the king's house, thou shalt tell it to Zadok and Abiathar the priest. And behold, they have there with them their two sons, Ahimaaz, Zadok's son, and Jonathan, Abiathar's son. And by them ye shall send unto me everything that ye can hear. So Hushai, David's friend, came into the city, and Absalom came into Jerusalem. That concludes the seven-minute read for today from Second Samuel, the 15th chapter. Now we're going to go right on in and I pray these recordings hold up. We're going to go right into the commentary of Absalom's rebellion. Chariots and horses and 50 men to run before him. Now this means that Absalom did not want the chariot for speed, but to make an impressive procession. This was Absalom the politician, sensing what the people wanted and knowing how to give them the image of it. That's what our past president he knew what the people wanted, and he gave them exactly what they wanted, riled them up and had them start a riot. People like that, diverse of people, they know how to get what they want because they read people real good, and that's what Absalom had done in these, what, two, three years that he was away from his dad. So Samuel, who anointed Absalom's father as king, was a judge, a leader, and a prophet in Israel. Yet Samuel never went around with horses and chariots in an entourage, Samuel traveled on foot and as a man. Absalom wasn't worthy to be mentioned in the name in the same breath as Samuel. So whenever anyone who had a lawsuit came to the king for decision, ancient kings were more than the heads of government. They were also the supreme court of their kingdom. If someone believed that a local court did not give them justice, they then appealed to the court of the king where the king or a representative of the king heard their case. 
Your case is good and right, but there is no deputy of the king to hear you. Absalom stirred up dissatisfaction with David's government and campaigned against David, his own daddy, by promising to provide justice that David supposedly denied the people. Oh, that I were made judge in the land, I would give him justice. Absalom had reason to be disillusioned with David's administ administration of justice. When Amnon raped Tamar, David did nothing. When, Abs when Absalom did something about it, David banished Absalom and kept him at a distance even when he came back. So whenever anyone came near to bow down to him, that he would put out his hand and take him and kiss him. Kiss him. So Absalom was skilled at projecting a man of the people image. In an obvious display, he wouldn't let others bow down to him, but would lift them up, shake their hand, and embrace them. From what we know of Absalom, we guess that he really didn't consider himself a man of the people at all. He regularly acted as if he was above others, and the laws that applied to others didn't apply to him. He knew he was better looking. He knew he was better connected. He knew he was better off. And he knew he had political instincts than almost anyone. Better political instincts than almost anyone. But these political instincts made Absalom aware that he had to create the image of a man of the people. In ancient Israel, there were too easily impressed by image and too slow to see or appreciate the reality behind the image. Since the days of ancient Israel, we have only become more impressed by image over reality. How could an actor, a TV actor, you're fired. How could you become president of the United States? Because people are looking at that image, not looking at the reality. Never had a real job. Just acting on a TV program. And he become king. Lord have mercy. Absalom appeared to be the real. And was an undisputed heir to the throne. David could not in the course of nature, live very long, and most people are more disposed to hail the beams of the rising than to exalt in those of the setting sun. Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. Absalom's cunning campaign worked. He became more popular and more trusted than David. Absalom knew exactly how to do this. He carefully cultivated an exciting and enticing image, chariots and horses and 50 men running before him. He worked hard. Absalom would rise up early. He knew where to position himself besides the way to the gate. He looked for troubled people, anyone who had a lawsuit. He reached out to troubled people. Absalom would call out to them. He took a personal interest in the troubled person. What city are you from? He sympathized with the person. Your case is good and right. He never attacked David directly. No deputy of the king to hear you. He left the troubled person more troubled. No deputy of the king to hear you. Without directly attacking David, Absalom promised to do better. Oh, that I were your judge in the land, and everyone has any suit or cause would come to me, then I would give him justice. Um... Absalom's clever approach made him about to subvert and divide David's kingdom without saying any specific thing that could condemn him. If someone objected, Absalom would simply say, tell me one specific thing that I have said or done. In fact, Absalom could do all this and say, I'm helping David to deal with all this discontent. In fact, Absalom was promoting, promoting discontent. Somebody was promoting a riot. Y'all figure it out. David was Israel's greatest king, and Israel became satisfied with him and let a wicked, amoral man steal their hearts. There are many reasons why this happened. Well, David was getting older. David's sins diminished his standing. People liked change, and Absalom was exciting. Absalom was very skilled and very cunning. David had to enter into the fellowship of his sufferings and be rejected like the son of David would later be rejected. Behold a king, the greatest that ever lived, 
a profound politician, an able general, a brave soldier, a poet of the most sublime genius and character, a poet of the most high God and the deliverer of his country, driven for, driven from his dominion by his own son and abandoned by his own fickle people. People are fickle. We might say that Absalom's greatest sin was impatient. Absalom seemed to stand nearest to the throne, but his sin was that he sided during his father's life and endeavored to dethrone him in order to sit in his stead. Absalom plans the overthrow of David's kingdom. About 40 years, this perhaps was Absalom's age at the time. But some believe that this is a minor corruption of the text and that it should read four years based on the readings in Syriac and Arabic translations, Josephus and some Hebrew manuscripts. I don't know. It said after 40 years. So I would dare say that if it's after 40 years, a David might be about 70 years old and his son might be around that age. I don't know, but it don't matter. Absalom trying to take over his throne. Let me go to Hebron and pay the vow which I made to the Lord. Absalom committed, trans, committed treason under the guise of worship. He knew that the appearance of spirituality could work in his favor. It is possible, perhaps likewise, that Absalom did all this feeling spiritual and in God's will. Men in Absalom's place often deceive themselves with words like, Lord, you know we need your leadership. Thank you for raising me up for such a time as this. Sound like the United States leader. Guide me and bless me, O Lord, as I endeavor to do what is best for your people. Divisive people almost never see themselves as divisive. Narcissist, narcissistic people. They see themselves as crusades for God's righteous cause and often believe or hope God's hand is upon them. This is especially a problem because many people will only believe a person is divisive if that person admits to being divisive. Go in peace. Ironically, these were David's last words to Absalom. Upon hearing these, Absalom went to carry out the plot to overthrow David's kingdom. Absalom reigns in Hebron. Absalom counted on the hope that most of Israel would see this as succession and not treason. Legitimacy for Absalom's government. With, that, with Absalom went 200 men invited from Jerusalem. Absalom wisely knew that he needed others to endorse, or at least to appear to endorse his government. He counted on these 200 men, who are not against David, to at least be silent and therefore give the impression that they were for Absalom. When the innocent and unknowing are among the divisive, their silence is always received as agreement. Absalom sent for Ahithophel, the Gilanite, David's counselor. Absalom's government gained more prestige when one of the top aides def defected to Absalom's side. This generally hurt David. He described his feelings in Psalms 41. Even my own familiar friend, in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. That happens to us sometimes. That person nearest and dearest to us can end up being your backstabber. It happens. Ahithophel was renowned for his wisdom and his wise counsel, 2 Samuel 16, 23. That's coming up. Even wise men can take their side with divisive and destructive leaders. In Ahithophel's case, it was probably prompted by a sense of personal hurt and bitterness because of what David did to Ahithophel's granddaughter, Bathsheba. Aha! Uh -huh. 2 Samuel eleven three and 23, 24. Now, while he suffered sacrifices, Absalom was careful to keep up his religious practices, both for the sake of images and because he was deceived enough to think that God wanted to bless him. All oh, the conspiracy grew strong. Once some people started coming to Absalom's side, it encouraged more and more and more to come. Momentum for division builds because others are already causing division. David escapes with the help of faithful friends, so David flees to Jerusalem. Arise and let us flee, or we shall not escape from Absalom. David knew well that Absalom was a ruthless um, David knew well that Absalom was a ruthless man 
who valued power over principle. He didn't want the city of Jerusalem to become a battleground, strike the city with the edge of the sword, so he fled the city. The kings, the king, the king. The writer here wanted to emphasize that David was the king, despite Absalom's treachery. The king left 10 women concubines to keep the house. David thought and had reason to think that these 10 women could be safely left behind. He felt he needed someone to look after his house. Sadly, this also tells us that David had at least 10 concubines. A concubine was essentially a legal mistress. The side piece, waiting, you know, he had a round away girl. In addition to David's many wives, this shows that David was a man who sometimes indulged his passions instead of restraining them in a godly way. I don't see why they took on concubines. They married wives. They done married four, five, six, seven, eight. Just keep on marrying folks and be legal, which what you're doing, but not. So all the Cherethites and the Pelethites, these men comprised David's personal bodyguard. The Gittites faithfully followed him from the time he lived among the Philistines, who followed him from Gath. These men who were faithful to David before he became successful also stuck with him when his success, when his success seemed to fade away. It's remarkable that in this defining moment of his later reign, foreigners rallied around David. It is more remarkable and tragic that his own countrymen, his own family, were nowhere to be found. Your family can put you down, y'all. Praise God. Pass before the king. As David watched this procession, leave Jerusalem and head for safety, he was greatly pained. This was reflected in the Psalms that David wrote during this time. David was afraid. He said, my heart is severely pained within me, and the terrors of my death have fallen upon me. Fearfulness and trembling have come upon me, and horror has overwhelmed me. So I said, oh, that I had wings like a dove. I would fly away and be at rest. Indeed, I would wander far off and remain in the wilderness. I would hasten to my escape from this windy storm and tempest. That's Psalms, the 55th chapter, verses 4 through 8. David put his trust in God. Lord, how they have increased who trouble me. Many are they who rise up against me. Many are they who say of me, there is no help for him in God. But you, O Lord, are a shield for me, my glory, and the one who lifts up my head. I cried to the Lord with my voice, and he heard me from his holy hill. I lay down and I slept. I awoke, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of 10,000 of people who have set themselves against me all around. Glory to the Lord. Psalms 3, 1 and 6. Psalms 41, Psalms 61, 62 and 63 were also written during this period. David's faithful friends, why are you also going with me? As David watched the procession of his faithful supporters, Ittai the Gittite caught his eye. David couldn't understand why this newly arrived foreigner took the risk of such openly loyalty to David. Return and retain, remain with the king. In calling Absalom the king, David showed that he would, not cling, he would not cling to the throne. At that moment, it seemed that Absalom would succeed, so David called him the king and let, left it with the Lord. As my lord the king lives, Ittai meant David, not Absalom. David told Ittai, remain with the king. Ittai answered back, that's exactly what I intend to do. And you are the king. I'm staying with the king. Whatever place my lord the king shall be, whether in death or life, even there also your servant will be. Just want to real quickly note here, I heard someone say today, our family, our family are our relatives. They are related to us, but they are not our family. Who is thy mother, father, sister, brother, except them to do the will of God? That is your family. That's just, just a sidebar. So it, it to I was David's family. Praise God. Whatever place my Lord the King shall be, whether in death or in life, we family. Even there also your servant will be. We are a smart family. Praise God. It to I, it to I was loyal to David when it looked certain that it would cost him something. 
True loyalty isn't demonstrated until it is likely to cause some, someone to be loyal. Remember, the more rebels there are, the more need for us to be conspicuously loyal to our king. We learn a lot from Ittai, demonstration of loyalty. Ittai was loyal when David was down, when he needed somebody to pull him up. He was there. We got three more pages. I'm reading fast. It's been 25 minutes. I hope these videos hold up. Ittai was loyal decisively. Ittai was loyal voluntarily. Ittai was loyal though he was a new newcomer to David's cause. Ittai was loyal publicly. Ittai was loyal knowing that the fate of David was now his fate. If David die, he gonna die. If David rule, he gonna rule with David. If Ittai claimed with David's person and character, though a foreigner and a stranger, felt that he could enlist beneath his, his banner for life, yea, and declare that he would do so there, and then, how much more may you and I, if we know what Christ has done for us, and who he is, and what he deserves at our hands, at this good hour plight our troth to him and vow, as the Lord liveth, surely in whatsoever place the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ shall be, whether in death or life, even there also shall his servant, Mama Pam, you shall you be. Praise God. So we must determine that wherever Jesus is, we will be also. Jesus lives in the heavenlies, so we will be. Jesus is with his church, that's us, so we will be. Jesus is busy in his work, so we will be. Jesus is with his children, so we will be. Now toward the way of the wilderness, many years before David left the safety of Saul's palace to live as a fugitive. Those years in the wilderness prepared David to be the king. God sent David out into the wilderness to continue the same work in his life. Ah, we do not like going over a Kurt Kedron when it comes to the pinch, how we struggle against suffering and especially against dishonor and slander. How many there were who would have gone on pilgrimage, but that Mr. Shame proved too much for them. They could not bear to go over the black brick Kedron, could not endure to be made nothing of for the sake of the Lord of glory, but they even turned back. Praise God. David's submission to God's chastening. Zadak also and all the Levites with him bearing the Ark of the Covenant of God. The priests were loyal to David, even though it probably meant death for them if, a, if, a, if Absalom succeeded. It was good that the men who should be spiritually sensitive to Absalom's evil and David's good were indeed sensitive to it. Carry the Ark of God back into the city. So David trusted in God, not in the Ark of the Covenant. He was willing to let the ark go back to Jerusalem and to put his God's, put his fate in God's hand. If I find favor in the eyes of the Lord, he will bring me back. If he says thus, I have no delight in you, here I am. Let him do to me as seems good to him. Praise God. So David's, I don't know who this is. They're calling me. Can you call me back? Praise God. I have no delight in you. Here I am. Let him do to me as seems good to you. So David's humble and chastening spirit proved to be that he knew God dealt with him righteously. David submitted to God with an active submission, not a passive one. David sends the priest back to gather information. Are you not a seer? So David recognized that Zadok was a priest. A man of supernatural insight might be a valuable information source for David. So David went up by the accent of the Mount of Olives. When Jesus went from the Last Supper to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray, he essentially traced these same steps of David. Both David and Jesus suffered for sin, but Jesus suffered for our sin. David suffered for his own sin. Weep as he went up, and he had, and he had his head covered and went bare feet. Now these were symbols of mourning. David was struck by the greatness of his tragedy for the nation, for his family, for himself. This wasn't a pity party of soreness, merely over the con um, consequences of his sin. He's crushed by the consciousness that he, the consciousness that his punishment is deserved, the bitter fruit of the sin that filled all his latter life with darkness. His courage and his buoyance have left him. Praise God. 
In light of all the facts, it is almost certain that the tears David shed as he climbed Mount Olivet were rather those of humiliation and penance than those of self-centered regret. For Absalom, there was no excuse, but David carried in his own heart ceaselessly the sense of his own past sins. One more page. This shows David was a redeemed man. Some would say that God let David off easy, that he deserved the death penalty for adultery and murder. If God forgave him and spared David that penalty, surely David would just do it again. Those who think this way do not understand how grace and forgiveness work in the heart of redemption. David's sin was ever before him, and in a strange combination of deep gratitude and horror over his forgiven sin, David never did it again. Turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. So David knew that Ahithophel was normally a good advisor, but he prayed that he would give foolish counsel to Absalom. This was done according, accordingly. Great is, great is the power of faithful prayer. The Queen Mother of Scotland was heard to say that she more feared the prayers of John Knox than of any armor fighting men. David made David had come to the top of the mount where he worshiped God. David's life was in danger and he had to flee. Yet he took time to stop at the top of Mount Olives, look back upon Jerusalem and the tabernacle, and he worshiped God. David knew worship was always important and he could worship when circumstances were bad. Then you may defeat the counsel of Ahithophel for me. David sent his other side, Hashua, uh, back to Jerusalem to, fr to frustrate Ahithophel's counsel to Absalom. Absalom came into Jerusalem. Absalom came into Jerusalem as a cunning, wicked rebel. David came into Jerusalem as a brave, noble conqueror in 2 Samuel 5, 6, and 7. And Jesus came into Jerusalem as a servant and king. Matthew 24, 4, and 10. Whew, that concludes it. It was 32 minutes. We did good. We did good. And the recordings looked like they kept going. Again, this is who we are. This is who we are. We are Smurf Family International Ministry. We are an international ministry where I read the word of God seven minutes every day. And then I come back. I read the word at 3 p.m. Central Standard Time. And then I come back and I read the commentary at 7 p.m. to give you clarity on what we have previously read. Today, we read it all together. Praise the name of the Lord. If you want to be a blessing to this woman of God, feel free to send your blessing to dollar sign, Mama Pam 23, dollar sign, Mama Pam 23. And uh, all the recordings of the reads are at this place. They're at this place. Be sure to like and subscribe if you go and look at the recordings of the seven minute read and the commentaries. Praise God. All right, that concludes that for today. God bless. Let me turn these recordings off.